Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining this session. I'm really excited uh, that you are taking advantage of all of the breakout sessions that we have today to continuously learn uh, about leveraging data uh, going into the second half of the year. Now, you may be jumping from uh, the, the previous session we just had with Steve Silver uh, from Forrester, uh, where he was able to give you the halftime speech when it comes to leveraging data in the new buying landscape. Now, in alignment to that, for this session, we're going to be talking about leveraging data to perfect the audible. Uh, and for our guest speaker today, we have Dale Mitchell, uh, who is the head of operations at Fujitsu America. So that being said, I'm going to hand it over to Dale, uh, who's going to be sharing his content. Dale? Great. Thank you, Isaac. Appreciate the introduction and appreciate everybody taking time out of your calendar. Uh, to listen to me. I, I don't have a typical background for somebody in operations. I spent 31 years leading sales teams, uh, being a salesperson, et cetera. And it's only in the last couple of years that I've spent really in operations. And once I took this role, uh, it became clear to me that we need to leverage the data that we had inside our organization in a fashion uh, better than, than we ever had in the past. And part of it's the changing landscape that's in front of us. And I think that was proven last year. And, and I entitled this, uh, this deck Omaha, Leveraging Data to Perfect the Audible. Omaha, of course, in reference to Peyton Manning's favorite uh, audible call. But I think it's very important to understand that in, uh, in the sales world, if we're going to adapt to market, we need to change quickly. Now, many of you may not know much about Fujitsu. So real quick, a couple slides that talk about who we are. Uh, we've been in business for 80 plus years, um, 140 employees across the globe. 140,000 employees across the globe, um, various regions. And I, I think what we're most important is about our external recognition. You see some in the lower middle of this slide, but we've had nine years on the Dow Jones Sustainability World Index, five years as a gold award winner for the Pride Index, three years consecutively for Fortune's Most Admired Companies. And last year, we were, we were uh, awarded by Forbes as one of America's best managing consulting companies for our thought leadership in the mobility and converged market space. Now, that's who we are, but what do we do? Right? We focus on a handful of industries trying to improve um, the, the, the performance of those industries, how they view performance. So it's as simple as helping feed the world. It's as simple as enabling green manufacturing. It's as simple as improving the client experience. And, and these need to be measurable outcomes with purposeful results. Right? We don't implement technology for technology's sake. And how do we do this? Via a variety of horizontal technologies uh, where we've got certain skill sets. Now, there's one other aspect of Fujitsu that many people don't know. And that's that we actually are primary sponsor of an American football team in Japan. And uh, in fact, we've won four of the last five Japan Expos, which is their equivalent of the Super Bowl. Last year, we did lose to the Obik Seagulls 13-7. Obviously, a defensive battle, uh, but between the Wolves and the Seagulls, I'm not sure how the Seagulls won that defensive battle. So I think we need to demand a recount. But if any football team, for it to be successful, has to have a strong foundation. And it's the same with our sales team. And it begins with a playbook. The playbook is, is how do we execute? How do we execute on a day-to-day -day basis? We call that playbook the business of selling. And it's to have discipline in terms of how we, how we take care of our data, how we maintain our data, and it includes external references to make sure we're keeping our data on par with what's going on in the industry. And, and for that, we've actually implemented the DMB Optimizer product as a way for us to maintain a common core set of data that we know has a solid external reference. So that's the playbook. Next is the system, right? And this is, we term this how we sell. And Everybody needs to understand each other's roles and responsibilities. Bill Belichick is famous for a saying called, do your job, right? Even though you need to understand everybody's roles and responsibilities, you need to primarily execute on doing your job. And where that becomes important is in sequencing. I need to know I need to do my job first. If I'm a center, I need to snap the ball before the quarterback knows how they can execute, right? That sequencing helps develop trust in people. When people do their job and they execute them in the proper sequence, that develops the trust. So if now we've got a system that has trust in data and trust in people, 
Now we need to focus on the next step, which is how do we give them the right equipment? All right? The right equipment uh, comes in two couple different flavors. One, you need to have the right tools, right? You need to have a CRM system. You need to have an ERP system. In our case, we need to have an account planning system. All of that work together as a toolkit for our sellers. You need to have efficient training on how to use these tools. You don't teach quarterbacks how to use a blocking sled, right? You, they need to have uh, position-specific training, and that's something that we're in the middle of implementing via microtraining because sellers have a hard time sitting in front of a computer for even more than 20 minutes taking a training class. We need to provide them snippets of training that are available at the point in time they need it. So constant feedback on that training, constant position coaching is what we need to accomplish via our training. And last, um, very important for us to consider the work-life shift. People are working from their homes. They're no longer coming in for training. So we had to re-architect it for the mobile environment, whether they're on their cell phone, whether they're on their laptop, whether they're on some sort of tablet. Last thing you have to have for a successful team is, um, is people, right? You need to have star talent. Hard to win without star talent, but you also need support talent, right? You see the team up above and you see a draft room down below. Granted, different sport, not football. It is baseball, but it's the only, uh, it's the only team room I can find. And, and for us, support people come in three different, um, three different categories. One is, is, uh, is transactional. These are the people that help the flow on a day-to-day -day basis. So they help process transactions. They help make sure um, our data is correct, et cetera. Second is informational. And these are report people. These are people that aggregate data, create reports that we use on a week-to-week, month-to-month uh, operational standpoint in terms of how we drive our business. And the last is probably, and probably more important, is you need to have what are called chinkers, at least what I call chinkers. And for those of you that don't know what a chinker is, it actually is a profession. When you build a log house, there are always gaps between the logs. The stuff that goes in, the in between those gaps is called chinking. And there are people, and that's what they do. They plug those gaps in the logs because you can build the best system that you could possibly have, and there are going to be gaps. And those gaps, you need chinkers. You need people that are adaptable. Uh, inside your own organization, those are the people that you don't really know what they're supposed to do, but you know you can't live without them. All right? And those are people that can be very valuable as we look at, uh, at your business, at our business, and, and how we execute. So you've got a solid foundation. The next thing you got to have is a plan and a schedule. Right? And the, the plan on the top left there, you can look, and that's the Daleville football schedule. And that's a, that's a high school football team. Um, and you have to send scouts to the high school football team. You have to send them to the college football team, all in preparation for the draft. Now, the draft we refer to as our budget, or in our case, we refer to it as our midterm plan, and it's a three-year rolling budget. And it asks us to anticipate the future needs of our clients. It anticipates the future shifts in the marketplace and allows us to begin to think through how can we research, how can we accommodate, and how can we shift to take advantage of uh, market dynamics. Then you have to have a, a training schedule, right? Um, because football is not a, a, a two-month or a six-month initiative. You have to be training all year round. And this training is, um, is constant looking at the data. It's looking at offering performance. It's looking at seller performance. It's looking at profitability analysis. That's what has to always be running in the background, as well as the cleansing. Who's looking at the data and making sure that it's accurate, that it's as correct as possible? And that's another process we have running in the background. And then what happens is you release the schedule, right? The first part of the schedule is training camp. Training camp ends and you get ready to go in the regular season. And that's what that lower right box is. That's actually the entire football season from uh, 2019, uh, all on one page. And we know when, um, when the games are, when we have to travel. We begin to develop game plans for each of the games in the future. And you can do that all at the beginning of the year. And we did that last year. Our training camp ended March 12th. Our fiscal year started April 1. And then what happened? Chaos, chaos theory, made popular in Jurassic Park, meaning you can, you can plan as much as you want, but there will always be something that'll take hold. And uh, here's a reference to the Chicago Bear Philadelphia Eagle game from 1988, where playoff implications, 
um, Super Bowl implications. Both teams arrived. They had a great game plan. Each had a great, great game plan, I'm sure. We'll never know because they didn't get to use it. They got to the game and a, and a heavy fog rolled over Soldier Field, which made visibility impossible. So they had to really quick call an audible and alter the game plan. And that's what happened to us last year. Our, our fiscal year started April 1, right? Right at the start of COVID. We started our planning process in November. We had to throw our game plan out the window and we had to execute on a handful of things very quickly. First, we had to worry about the safety of our employees, right? We don't want our players getting injured there out on the field. So we had to make sure we took the right precautions in our office, had to make sure we, uh, we, we were monitoring the care of our employees um, and we had to enable to work from home because that was new in some of our locations. Second is we had to ensure the surety of our clients' businesses. We had people working on behalf of our clients, helping them achieve the objectives. We had to make sure their business was being taken care of and make accommodations with their business and make accommodations with our mutual arrangements. Once we completed that, we had to take a look at the now what. What audible are we going to call? Right. And we decided to play the, uh, the long game. So we didn't take an immediate, we didn't take any immediate actions. We sat down in a room virtually and decided, how are we going to play this out? And everybody had different ideas. Everybody had different opinions in terms of what should be our play. But then we went to data, right? We went to look at the data to say, what should we do? And how should we make a change to our, to our game plan for, um, in that case, our fiscal year 20? But when it came to data, I had a secret weapon, right? I had a chinker, named, not named Peter Brand, but the, he's probably the most famous chinker out there. Uh, Peter Brand was the guy under which the movie Moneyball was really written. Peter Brand was an employee of the Cleveland Indians, sat in the back room, uh, and that's the guy that Billy Bean stole because he had a, uh, he had a system called uh, Cybernomics, which was looking at um, data differently for baseball. And I had a similar individual that I had tucked away, kept him apart from our operations, kept him apart from our reporting, kept him apart from our politics. And he went to work and began to identify trends. Uh, some trends seem almost counterintuitive, right? Some seem obvious, but it's only when faced with the data that we were able to make these decisions. And one of the first trends he noticed is that at the in the middle of the COVID, between April and July, Nobody wanted to talk to anybody they didn't already know. So our whole new logo acquisition or acquire clients, um, however you term it in your business, we had to throw that game plan out the window, right? No one was going to talk to us at this point in time because everybody's in survival mode. Second is we noticed that people were unwilling to engage in long-term commitments. They were more interested in short-term contracts. They were more interested in doing things to get them over the hump until we could all figure out what the new normal was going to be. And then the third thing we noticed is that clients started to ask us for longer payment terms and conditions. We knew there was going to be a cash crunch. So we had to take on um, risk mitigation for our cash preservation. We had to help our clients that needed that cash help because as a partner, and if we're focused on their business results, that's just what you do. Um, results last year were pretty good. We ended up uh, at 97% of our original revenue budget uh, and our margins exceeded targets. Right? Where we were down was on our bookings targets or on our sales targets, but I think that was to be expected. Um, but the fact that we were able to make that pivot, we were able to call that audible uh, was incredibly important to us. And I think there were a couple learn learned lessons there is one, trust the data, right? And when people had opinions, and, and wanted to execute a program and they didn't have supporting data, we just stopped it. We, we, we asked them to develop data to support the actions that they wanted to take. Second is it would have been incredibly helpful at that point in time had we had an engine that could help us deliver insights on our, what our clients were doing. What were they looking at? How were they looking to accommodate their businesses? While we had our contacts, it would be nice to have another reference of, uh, of data for that process. So what did we learn, right? Our, our foundation is, should be built on data. That should be the center point of, of our new team foundation. 
And every other aspect of it held, our playbook, our systems, our equipment, our people, but we found they worked better together when they had a common set of data that they were pulling from, they were making decisions on. And, um, and it really helped validate our model. And now we come to this year, right? What happened again? Chaos theory. Um, back, in, um, back in 2012, Fujitsu embarked upon an initiative called One Fujitsu. Uh, prior to that, we had operated more as a Koretsu, where each region operated as an independent business and quickly realized our global clients wanted, wanted one Fujitsu. They wanted the Fujitsu in Europe to be the same as Fujitsu Americas. And this was the year beginning literally this 1st of April that we decided we need to aggregate the data from the 20 different ERP systems and the 35 different CRM instances, right? Huge master data management problem between our sales force and our ERP system. Um, we were fortunate enough in that we had already made a decision to standardize our client data on a DUNS number. So that gave us a globally accepted uniform key by which we can aggregate data. As it turns out, Japan had already made the same decision as had Australia. So it was very easy for us to begin the planning phase of how are we gonna pull together this data. And from a, um, a client standpoint, what we hope this will allow us to do by having that uniform view of the data is to be able to get a better perspective on their wants and needs across the globe. Um, if there's one thing that we've learned both as Fujitsu and talking to our clients is that global collaboration is a challenge, not only between companies, but also inside an existing company. So the more we can help them understand what their various regions are looking at, we can help them understand uh, the differences in, in geographies and the differences in the technical architecture and business processes and geographies, the more we can remain a strong partner in helping them achieve those purposeful results we talked about earlier. Now, this chaos theory hit April 1, but again, what we found out is, um, is that the new team foundation is holding with the data with the strong external references that, that's provided by, uh, by DMB and, uh, and with the systems that are built with data as the core. Now, future-wise, we really need to do a better job and, and I've got a team working on how to do a better job into artificial intelligence and machine learning, not only about our clients, but also about ourselves. And I think the, um, the one insight that we've learned as we've gone through this process is that the speed of decision-making is critical to survival. If we hadn't made the decision to pivot, to call the Omaha Audible as quickly as we did in May uh, and still uh, wonder what we should be doing, uh, we wouldn't have been able to have a successful year as we had last year. So in conclusion, um, I, I guess two main points. Number one, you need to have a strong foundation, right? We understand what our core data elements are and we've time tested them. We need to have an external reference to validate that that data is accurate and it is representative of what's in the market. The last is we need to have a process and we need to maintain our process to clean our data, to make sure it's accurate, to make sure deals are properly represented in the proper sell cycle in our CRM system, to make sure they're attributed to the right offerings, to the right, uh, to the right clients, to the right industries. And that's critical. And thankfully, we have had that process in place for a couple of years and have found it to be incredibly beneficial. Second main uh, item in conclusion is we have to accept chaos theory. It's going to happen. And, and I, I think the first sub-bullet under that is you need to have people that are passionate about data, right? As a leader, um, it does get a little boring when I'm in a meeting and we're spending the whole time talking about data sets and normalization and, and the, the things that are very important to people that are passionate about the data. But what that, what that allows them to do is keep an objective view over where the business is and where it's going. And I was fortunate enough to have a Peter Brand. I parked him in a corner, didn't tell anybody what his job was, and I let him play for a couple of years so that he understands that data better than anybody else in our company. So he can look at a report that looks a little funny and say, oh, here's what you did wrong. Here's what you forgot to exclude. We're no longer in that market. That needs to be excluded. And he can say so with confidence. And now he's developed the confidence of everybody inside our organization and view him and his organization now as really the go-to uh, for our enterprise data. 
Uh, second sub bullet is you need tools. Right? The, the, the tools are an ever evolving market. We just made a decision to go to DMB Hoover's uh, from, a, from a previous competitor uh, because our market's evolved. Our market needs has evolved. And that's the beauty of software as a service. I'm not making a five, 10 year commitment. I'm making a two year commitment. And who knows what our needs will be two years from now. They might change, right? And I trust that our partner's gonna change with us. Um, but in case it doesn't, I always have a hedge. And, and I think that's as important as anything else. And, and thankfully, again, DMB has adopted that model. And uh, in, in addition to, to partnering with us on the business model that we need, they provide us that external validation of our data. And every now and then, if you do all these things right, you might find something good that'll happen. And, and for us, it was um, out, of, out of the bad that came out of COVID. Um, we ended up uh, leveraging our data to identify a company out there that could take advantage of one of our technologies. And that was a company called Entanglement that had begun to work with DARPA and the, uh, the US Army to develop a, um, an optimized distribution at first for personal protective equipment because very early on in the COVID last summer, um, the government had a surplus of, uh, of ventilators, right? Sitting in a warehouse. There were hospitals that were short on ventilators. So at first pass, the federal government just sent those ventilators to whatever hospitals asked. Well, the problem is they got into the hospitals, they'd plug them in and they'd short out all their power. They didn't have enough power to run their ventilators. So you had some hospitals that needed ventilators that had power, some hospitals that had ventilators but couldn't even plug them in, right? This is a quantum computing problem because you also had to track who's gonna have the next COVID outbreak. How do we get the ventilators to the people that have them, right? And ventilators are just one example. Now that same model and that same quantum computing model is now being assigned to the booster shots for the COVID vaccines. The initial COVID vaccine distribution was brute force. And that's where you kept hearing stories about uh, not having enough refrigeration, not having enough syringes, not having enough people to administer. Well, we can't make that mistake a second time. We have to be far more efficient. And that's where um, the solution that we're putting in place through quantum computing is gonna take a look at what are the road conditions? How, how much refrigeration do they have? How many syringes do they have? Um, how many people do they have in that area that might or might not be infected? All that needs to get built in a real-time model that can really only be solved through quantum computing. So um, throughout this discussion today, hopefully I've given you some insights into uh, data foundations that you need, some data processes that you need, uh, but more importantly, how to build an organizational construct that can help you make the right audibles at the right time. So uh, appreciate your time, appreciate the, uh, the audience, and I, I guess I'm opening up for question and answers. Yeah, thanks for that, Dale. And as we were speaking, I, I think we have a few questions that came in. You know, I, I do want to point out, man, it was, I did not know Japan had their own version of the Super Bowl. So that was a fun yeah. fact to, to learn about, and especially that Fujitsu sponsors. Uh, so yeah, let's get to the questions. I think we have. Okay. So the first question, Dale, uh, that we have is, how are you adapting to a higher expectation and buyer personalization? Um, great question. I, I think there are really three aspects. One is on the training aspects for our sales team to help them understand that it's not enough to, uh, to personalize to a company. You have to personalize to the individual decision makers that are involved. So that is a sales training exercise. Um, the second part, which is actually a little more difficult, it's uh, clients expect collateral that is tailored to them, to their industries at a level of detail that uh, we're not used to. So that's where we are using uh, trends and data, uh, specific client insights, client intent data uh, to help us, uh, in essence, prepare in advance uh, the, the anticipated request from our clients for collateral that's tailored to their specific purposes. Uh, at the end of the day, at least in our business of professional services, our final product is highly customized to that client. The question is, is the preparation and the material beforehand uh, needs to match the same level of customization that we deliver to our clients. Great feedback there. 
Uh, the following question is, do you think there will be more changes coming, uh, specifically with everyone returning to the office? If so, how would this affect sales? Yeah, interesting. And, and I think I commented during, um, during my previous uh, talk is um, clients were confused on how to make decisions when all the constituents that are involved in the decisions are now distributed. Right. So what we saw over the last 10 years is an increase in the number of people involved in large scale decisions in our clients. Um, and I think a lot of that just had to do with co-location. Um, will we see that trend continue or we see it spin the other way where there will be fewer people engaged in the decision process compared to years past just because of some of the complexities of remote work? So that is something that we're watching and tracking data on very closely. Um, it, it'll be interesting to see how that manifests itself from, from a sales interaction and a sales rep standpoint, uh, clients are still trying to decide whether they want personal visits or don't want personal visits. So we're really, really playing that on a, on a client by client case by case basis. Um, our workforce is very used to working virtually, uh, very few Fujitsu salespeople actually work in an office. Uh, our support people tend to also work remotely. So. Um, for us, it's more about what the clients are looking for and how the clients choose to interact with us. And, and we'll match that accordingly. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a, that's a great feedback. Um, another question is around um, specifically, you know, sales and marketing alignment, right? And I think this person is trying to ask, how are you overcoming, you know, the discrepancies that you typically see from sales and marketing and really just bridging that gap? Uh, I guess this is, you know, as a result, you want to see better communication uh, as well as, you know, being aligned in terms of the campaigns that are executed. Uh, how would you describe some of the successes you've seen in that end? Yeah, very interesting. Uh, Fujitsu, if you were to look at our financials, we spend less than one half of 1% of our revenues on marketing. Um, and, and a lot of that just has to do with uh, the heritage of the Fujitsu brand in Japan. But we recognize we have to do more and um, have to do more with just moderate increases in budget. So it really is a hand-in-hand -hand effort between us in marketing, meeting on a consistent basis, understanding what are the trends we're seeing in the industries and what's the, the collateral, the demand generation techniques we have to use in order to get in front of the clients with the proper market message. And I wish I had a secret sauce. There isn't one. It literally is just brute force uh, people sitting on Teams calls, talking about what needs to happen, what's the best way, what's the best um, uh, the, the, the best audience, how to tailor the audience, what's the message, and what's the right uh, media that we need in order to get our message out to the market. I agree. That's that's a great answer. It, it sometimes just calls for getting together, being aligned on planning, and making sure that you have everything in scope for, for the upcoming year. Um, the last question we have, it's actually a fun one. Um, was Tim Tebow a PR move for the Jags, or do you think he could actually add value for my fantasy draft? Very personal one. <laughs> I, uh, I would not pick him up in a fantasy draft. And personally, I thought it was a brilliant PR move by the Jacksonville Jaguars because it has taken all the media attention off of their first-year head coach, Urban Meyer, who would normally be under intense spotlight if he were the only story coming out of Jacksonville. But bringing in Tebow, I think, dilutes the pressure on him. Um, and especially with some of the health issues he's had in the past, I think it gives him a little more freedom to, uh, to do what he wants to with the team. Um, I don't know how they're going to be this year, uh, but it's just going to be uh, a, 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 a fantastic thing to watch. Great feedback. Maybe he'll uh, get some special teams reps or something like that. We'll see. But that is the final question, uh, question for today. Uh, thank you so much, Dale, for joining. Uh, we really appreciated you know, your, your, your presentation uh, as well as understanding, you know, perfecting the audible you know, throughout the year. So okay. thank you again. Terrific. Thank you, Isaac. All right.